welcome to the Album Man and today I'm going to be doing a review of Snake Charmer by Snake Charmer. And with a name like Snake Charmer it really won't surprise you to know this is a White Snake-esque band made up of some of the original members of the classic White Snake lineup. The members are Mickey Moody on guitar who was an integral part of the classic White Snake lineup. Neil Murray on bass, I think was the longest survivor except for of course Coverdale um, to the band, he was on 1987, I think, whereas the others, except for Coverdale, weren't. Laurie Wisefield on guitar from Wishbone Ash. Harry James on drums from Thunder and, of course, Magnum. Adam Wakeman on keyboards, Rick Wakeman's son, and he's also been in Ozzy's band quite a bit recently. And lastly, Chris Uzi on vocals, the guy I hadn't heard of, who's from Heartland. So these guys, they clearly aim to bring that 70s white snake classic rock sound. So do they end up revitalising hard rock and bringing back the sound that Coverdale seems to have completely lost? Or is this lineup a bit too good to be true? So, we start off with My Angel, and this starts with some acoustic guitar before Chris's vocals come in. And as I said, I can't say I knew him before this project, but man, can he definitely sing. Um, he really has a great voice, and it is demonstrated very well in this song. Anyway, the song, it comes alive with the introduction of the electric guitar riff, though the, ele the, the acoustic even is still very prominent throughout, and it all culminates in a very catchy chorus that shows the extent of Chris's voice. Um, the highlight, though, has to be the lovely little dueling guitar solo between Laurie and um, Mickey. And, yeah, it's definitely a good way to start the album. Then we get to a Accident Prone, which is the single from this album. And this song is a little more keyboard-driven than the last one, even though it still has those big chords. And it's one of my favourites on the album, I'd say. It's the first song I heard, and the song that made me want to listen to the band. And the chorus is great. It's just a really solid rock song. I mean, yes, it's not quite Here I Go Again or Fall For Your Love in, in catchiness, or greatness even, but it's still a really good, you know, 70s bluesy rock song. I definitely recommend checking that out if you don't know this band. And then we get to To The Rescue. This has a particularly bluesy sound about it, and I really like the bluesy groove. I mean, you know, to me, White Snake have always been about the bluesy um, side to them, and especially when they had, you know, Coverdale, or they still do, but I mean, you know, yeah, um, back in the day anyway. So, you know, I always thought Coverdale's voice particularly suited a very bluesy style. And I think he's lost that his current band. The last two White Snake albums pretty abysmal. <laughs> and, yeah, he seems to have lost his way. He doesn't seem to know how to pick a band anymore, which is a shame. Anyway, on with this song. And, um, yeah, so this bluesy sound it really is an integral part of the White Snake sound, so it's nice for it to be a highlight here. The problem I do have, though, is the chorus, which is a little bit anticlimactic. I mean, the build up to it is so good, and then it just sort of deflates a bit. But it's still a good song. And Chris's voice particularly reminds me of Glenn Hughes' on this song, which is no bad thing. I adore Glenn Hughes. As you can see, I have a burn up there. Okay, then we get to Falling Leaves. This starts with some beautifully picked guitar and some gentle piano before the vocals come in. And it's clearly, you know, it's going to be a ballad. And it's a very nicely done ballad, which builds to a wonderful emotion-filled guitar solo. And yeah, a very strong power ballad and another of the best um, songs on this album. The female backing singer is also particularly effective at lifting the chorus on this song. And then we get to A Little Rock and Roll. And, I mean, yes, this has a little, you know, cool bluesy riff to it, though it's not particularly special and it does feel quite cliché. And this is really where the problems start with this album for me, or certainly this is where some of the problems start being particularly highlighted. I mean, this song in itself, it's very nice. and it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't have anything particularly memorable instrumentally or vocally. And I'm going to use a little, a strange analogy for this one, so do bear with me. That this song, A Little Rock and Roll, really is the Final Fantasy VII of the album. Which means, it's not a bad song in itself, it's just, it starts trends which lead to a little bit of a downfall. 
though I'm not saying this exactly a Final Fantasy XIII song, which would mean that the whole thing's become massively stale, bland and crap. No, no, no. They definitely don't go down that far. But it's sort of the beginning of the end, I find, this song. But maybe I'm being a little harsh there. Because then we get to Ten of the Screw, which is a song I actually like quite a bit. Though it does suffer one of the major problems I have with the rest of the album. And one of the most important even in this style of rock, and this is the compelling guitar riff, as in there really uh, isn't much born in many of the songs. I mean, I want to hear Mick especially playing those catchy guitar riffs that make me just, you know, want to pick up my guitar and l look on the, for the tabs and just land them. You know, thinking, God, that's awesome, I have to play that. Instead, I just hear fairly tired, not particularly prominent guitar riffs that sound like someone trying to rekindle an earlier sound, but ultimately not succeeding. I mean, I know they're capable of better, they're you know, still exceptionally talented musicians. Anyway, Chris goes all out on this song. When the guitarists play lead, they certainly do sound inspired, and it is magical, but I just find with their rhythm they seem to, I don't know, it feels like they lost a little bit of interest. Anyway, it's a, it's a decent song, nothing massively special, but it definitely is a good song. And then we get to Smoking Gun, and I was trying to be patient before bringing this up, but when it got to this stage in the album, it's just like, why? I'll tell you what, now this song it has a bit more of a keyboard sound to it than some of the others, but yet it still highlights a problem with the keyboards that I have. And even if the guitar riff on this song actually is a little more compelling, I, I quite like it. Anyway, the problem I have with keyboards is, now I love Adam Wakeman as a um, pianist, keyboardist, whatever, I think he's fantastic, bloody good. Not as good as his father, but, you know, bloody good all the same. The guy has talent. But I feel like the incredible Derek Sherinian in the supergroup Black Country Communion, that Adam Wakeman is being severely underutilised. I mean, he plays pitiful amounts of keyboard, and they are all rhythm keys, effectively. I mean, I always thought Whitesnake didn't quite utilise the immense talent of John Lord enough, but, I mean, he definitely played quite a lot of lead melodies and stuff. You know, he, he did. I was listening to Live in the Heart of the City yesterday, and he was, you know, rocking that keyboard and doing a bloody good job and showing why he's, you know, rated as one of the best. But he sounds like they used him as much as ELP used Keith Emerson, as opposed to how much Adam's used. I really do feel sorry for him. It's like they just shoved him in a corner and just said, you know, play this one chord. And that's it. Ah, anyway, this song, it does actually have a particularly good chorus to it, which is one of my favourites after all this criticism. Yeah. But um, the chorus, it really does make this um, this song stand out. It's the verse and bridges, they're nothing to write home about. And then we get to Stand Up. This actually has a really good guitar riff, and one of the best on the album, I'd say. And it seems to have a little more energy to it. I really like the vibe the song gives off. And its chorus is catchy, and it's a well-done song. Now, Guilty of Charged. Guilty as Charged. This is another of my favourites. I really, really like this song. Especially, it's mainly because the chorus is so brilliantly delivered by Chris. It's a fantastic chorus. But still, as much as I do like this song, I still have some issues. And another issue to address with the album, really. And that's that most of the songs to me, certainly, and I'm sure I'll get a bit of hate for this, but oh well, they sound a little bit similar to me, a little bit too similar. There isn't that much that distinguishes each song from one another, and while some are better than others, of course, they seem to rely too heavily on that core sound. And I praise them for that core bluesy vibe. I just don't think they mix it up a bit. Yes, there's that one ballad, but except for that, I feel that most songs sound pretty much the same. Now that could be the fault of the production. There's something a little bit off about the production I just can't quite put my finger on. Well, there is one thing, but we'll talk about that in a sec. And, yeah, I, I just find that some of the songs are a little bland. But, well, not a little... Well, okay, it's sounding a bit too similar. There's not a bad song on this album. Let's, let's get that straight. Just a little bit, maybe too much repetition, I suppose. Certainly of the song structure. Then we get to Nothing to Lose, and this really feels like it would be better if it solved my final problem with this album. 
and this could just be because I'm listening to it on Spotify and it's not exactly known for its sound quality but to me, Neil Murray, who is a superb bassist by the way, seems to be severely turned down on this album. I mean, you can hear its bass, just about, but it's not very prominent at all. You barely notice it, and if it wasn't for the fact that I know how good he is from Whitesnake, I'd think that he was a pretty bog-standard average Joe bassist, which he isn't. He should be defining the riffs and driving the song, but instead he's chucked in that corner with Adam, so that they've been put on the naughty step. Anyway, this song in particular, it's a great example, really, of all my problems in one song. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not bad. No, it's just a, just a pleasant song. Okay, then we get to the last song on the end, which is Cover Me. And I don't have too much to say about this. I mean, it has that signature sound, doesn't offer much different. Yes, the guitar solos are cracking, but as I said, they just need to mix it up a bit, and by this point it just, it sounded a little repetitive. They got away with it at first, because, you know, it was like a fresher sound, but now they're starting to make their own sound a little stale. In conclusion, it may have sounded like I've been exceptionally harsh about this album, but we, maybe I came across as a bit too harsh. I really did enjoy this album. I just think that it has its flaws, and that the project has a lot of potential, and this is a really good debut but I'm just not sure they quite utilised all their potential. I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Definitely recommend it if you're a fan of that 70s White Snake-esque classic rock. I mean, yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. Definitely worth, I'd say, buying from, you know, maybe a 5 or something. And I am looking forward to the next release. I just hope they can, you know, improve and make the mind-blowing record that they're capable of. This has been the Alpha Man. Thanks for watching. Comment, rate, subscribe, and as usual... Long live, rock and roll, and also vote my poll for discography if you haven't already, description below.